Today on the Dolby Institute podcast, we sit down with the former president of the Directors Guild of America and one of the most successful directors working in television today, Paris Barkley. We talk about his early career successes and his work directing two episodes of the hit Netflix series Dahmer, which is season one of Ryan Murphy's series Monster. But it was work that we almost did not get to see because, as he tells us, Paris was initially very reluctant to take the job. I said, listen, I'm of an age where I lived through Jeffrey Dahmer, and I know what Jeffrey Dahmer did to black and gay men like myself, and I don't think it's it's worth doing another story that looks at Jeffrey Dahmer and in any way makes him um, a more credible, emotional, positive, possibly figure. So why did Paris decide to take this gig, and how did he manage to craft such engaging and heartbreaking stories depicting the impact of one of the most brutal serial killers in our history. This is just one of two episodes we're doing on Dahmer. So be sure to look out for our podcast episode with the producers and key members of the crew. But for now, let's hear from Paris about his process for directing his two episodes of this series. Paris, thank you so much for coming on the Dolby podcast and, and talking to us uh, about this show. Uh, tell me about getting that first call from Ryan Murphy and your reaction to it and what made you say, yes, I want to join the Dahmer team. I'm going to direct these, what turned out to be two of the really pivotal episodes of the series. Well, Ryan can be very persuasive. Uh, and so generally when he calls me, it's about something very special. Uh, I received a call like this on Glee, and that was an easy yes after I saw the pilot because they had already done the pilot there. This one was a hard no. Um, I'm doing a series about Jeffrey Dahmer and I want you to be a part of it is not a call that I'm delighted to receive. Uh, so I said, listen, I'm of an age where I lived through Jeffrey Dahmer and I know what Jeffrey Dahmer did to black and gay men like myself. And I don't think it's, it's worth doing another story that looks at Jeffrey Dahmer and in any way makes him, um, a more credible, emotional, positive, possibly figure. Uh, but Ryan said, oh, that's not what we're doing. <laughs> so what we're going to do is we're going to start out defining Jeffrey Dahmer, but then it's going to evolve much more so about the victims. And the particular episode that I'm casting you for is going to tell the story of Tony Hughes. And then he told me the story, which you see unfolded in episode six, Silence. And I thought, oh, my God, that's fascinating. I mean, to dive into that black, gay, deaf world and to really see this this young man with so many aspirations and actually to break people's heart in the end when they don't all come to fruition because of Dahmer's heinous behavior. Um, that that moved me. And I thought since it's episode six, it's the beginning of the second half. You know, Ryan always saw this as sort of the transition to focusing more and more on the victims and police, what they did and didn't do. Jesse Jackson comes into play. You know, we start really taking the whole system to task. And I thought that was worth doing. We be That episode becomes the linchpin to turn the series to its true aspirations, which is to not only shine a light on the victims, but also to talk about how the police's system and their behavior led to this going on for so many, many years. And hopefully in the end, that would um, awaken some people to the possibility that maybe their behavior is, you know, aiding and abetting people like Jeffrey Dahmer. So we're only trying to change the world here. <laughs> I appreciate you saying that. Uh, I think I had the same reaction when I heard about the show that you did, which is like, I don't really want to certainly not spend 10 hours of my life in, in, in the Dahmer world. But then Getting into it and realizing like, oh, there's a much bigger story here. This is not only about, it is about the victims, as you say, but it's also about, about systemic racism, about the homophobia and the, the AIDS hysteria of that era. And all of that kind of comes to play in your episode, uh, episode six is just, it's such a, as you say, it's a, it's a shift in tone. And I, I just love your, the way you explored Tony's world, as you said, the black, gay, deaf, you know, he's an aspiring, uh, model. Tell me about exploring that world and working with uh, Rodney B uh, Burford, who's just a, such a wonderful actor, and, uh, and, and, and building Tony's world. Well, when I read the script, which was by David McMillan and Janet Mock, with you know the usual assistance for me and Brennan and Ryan weighing in, I thought, this is a beautiful piece of work. This is a story worth telling. The script itself becomes the basis for every dream that we're going to have. 
And in the script, I got really emotional about Rodney immediately. Uh, just, you know, the fact that we spend so much time with him before we ever get to Jeffrey Dahmer. And we really get to see his humanity and his family and how he interacts and how he lives his life, you know, and, and you know, works to get a job and finally does have the luck to get one. All those things made me, you know, already start crying. So then when it came to realizing it, I thought, hmm, who are we going to get to play this kid? Who's going to be the guy? And fortunately, our casting people with Ryan uh, came up with Rodney Burford, who had only been on a, you know, deaf university. I think it's called Deaf U uh, reality series and hadn't really acted before. So I said, oh, great. So we're going to put the weight of this whole episode on someone who hadn't performed before with Evan Peters, who is literally one of the masters of this medium right now. Um, and then I met Rodney and I said, oh, I see. This character can become what Rodney is. I can help him reveal himself, his Rodney-ness, through Tony Hughes. And so what we did was really got him comfortable. We rehearsed with Evan, and we took everything kind of with a great deal of patience, and he rose to the occasion. I mean, he gave a performance that was selfless, but also self-full in the sense that that's who that guy is. When you actually meet him, you will see him as sort of a gentle giant and, and a loving person. And we wanted that to come through. So we really lucked out in getting him. And the fact that he was deaf and the fact that we communicated through translators and through ASL masters throughout became less and less of an impediment as each day went on. Um, and that's one of the things I've discovered. People are oh, it's so overwhelming. You have a deaf person. It's going to take so long or something. And what I've actually discovered, and I've had a few deaf actors on Station 19 before, so I've also had that experience, is that it's all about the love. It's all about the listening. It's all about the being willing to accommodate, to include. And I love that about that episode. When we brought him in and we brought his you know, co-stars and his little posse, Jared DeBusk and, and Michael Anthony Spady, it was joyful, you know, and some of the family did not know sign language and had to learn and some of them had some skills. And so we brought them all together and through rehearsal and working with the ASL masters because we had to, you know, translate things. You know, sign language isn't an explicit translation of what is in the script. It's a conceptual and often idiomatic communication. And so we had to make adjustments. And in that, I found a lot of joy. And I said, wow, this is not only for me, but we're going to reveal this whole world to people in a way that's intimate and that's real and that I think is really, really interesting. So the whole thing became just from what I thought would be dreadful and in the sense of full of dread, I, I found out actually it was joyful to be able to shine a light on these actors and this community, on these victims of Jeffrey Dahmer and push Jeffrey a little bit to the side for a bit. You did that so well. And I think, you know, one of the things that I found so shocking about your episode is I, I was not expecting to have uh, what, what ended up as a romantic love story right in the middle of this uh, story about this horrific serial killer. <clears throat> and it's, it's, it's really the only moment of genuine human connection that we see Dahmer have through the course of the, of the show. And ultimately for me, that's what made the episode so devastating. You know, we're, we're, we're desperately hoping for a different outcome than the one that we know is coming. So mm -hmm. I, I, tell me about walking that tone, you know, that fine line with the tone, which is, it becomes almost more horrific to us because there is this genuine human connection. But at the same time, I'm sure you didn't want to, you didn't want the audience to feel sympathy for Jeffrey in this situation mm -hmm. or make him less of a monster than he ultimately is. So as a director, you're ultimately responsible for the tone. Tell me how you navigate and walk that fine line. That's one of the most difficult challenges of the whole thing. Um, I didn't really see it as a love story because I don't believe Jeffrey Dahmer is capable of love. I believe Jeffrey Dahmer thinks he might be. And when he's you know, appropriately medicated and in some sort of psychological state where he feels like he's normal. And in this episode, he cleans his house and he has his parents and things seem to be going well. I think he thinks he could be a normal person, but he cannot. You know, he is truly, you know, the tiger that doesn't change his stripes. So in a sense, Evan is playing at his dream as Rodney is. Both of them are reaching for their dream, but Evan's dream is truly fictitious. He just doesn't really understand, or rather Dahmer's dream, not Evans. So what I did was I just put this, I weighed the scales as much as a director can towards Tony. 
You know, I tended to shoot them in 50-50s from the time they first met. They sit at the bar in a 50-50 in equality, you know, not overemphasizing Jeffrey. When we chose to take the sound out, and I know we'll come back to that again, we chose it very, very deliberately to put ourselves in Tony's perspective at certain times and sort of to, to take a secondary role or make Jeffrey assume a secondary role, which I think was really part of actually the joy of this, because I'm not a big Dahmer fan. And while Evan is incredibly charming, as many killers are, I had to sort of de-charm him in a way. And the way I did it was by shooting him from farther away than Tony, shooting Tony closer, letting Tony have basically what I call the love, letting him have the angles that actually are heroic. You know, even when he talks to his mom, the camera's very low, and Tony's quite big. I want the audience to feel that Tony is the hero of the story. He is not the you know obstacle in that sense. And Dahmer is very, very much the villain. Tony is the protagonist. It's a story about him. And so everything I could do in terms of how I framed it, how I used his point of view, I never showed you Dahmer's point of view of Tony, but often I showed you Tony's point of view of Dahmer. It's just decisions like that that go through each scene help to give you the feeling that this is not Jeffrey Dahmer's story. He's just living in Tony's story. Amazing. Amazing. Yeah. You, I, obviously you've worked with Ryan Murphy, uh, many times. Um, and, and he is, a uh, I, I think a creator, you know, known for shows like American Horror Story and Neptuck, you know, not, not, not stories that I would say are uh, models of restraint as far as gore and violence and, and horror. And so I, I think part of my reticence too was thinking, well, this is Ryan Murphy telling Dahmer's story. This is going to be a really tough ride. And it, ultimately was, but not for the reasons that I was expecting. There's very mm -hmm. little gore and violence in this, in this show. Um, there, yeah, there really isn't in this episode at all. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and so I, but you I know, find the, what's your question? Sorry. No, no, no. no. I just, I, the, the whole thing feels so remarkably restrained to me. So, and I know that you, you know, and then ultimately in episode 10, you do have a, a, a moment of really terrifying violence. So tell me about, about navigating that and, and being restrained and then using it, you know, obviously where appropriate. Well, I like to be restrained. Uh, <laughs> I think the audience is more emotionally invested when they make the movie. And what I mean by that is you present something to them that stimulates their imagination. And so they complete the movie. And that is, to me, the, the I always call it the Susan Sarandon effect, because whenever I see Susan Sarandon, for some reason, I just feel emotionally engaged with her. I don't know why. Um, but you know, when he actually kills Tony, for instance, I don't show his face. I don't show him making that decision. We go down to his feet and you see him drop the note that Tony gave. And then you see him run towards Tony and you don't see him bash Tony with a hammer or anything. That's left up to your imagination. And I think that's good suspense works that way. Dr. Hitchcock taught me that way back when from watching all those movies. Um, and, and I felt in this particular episode, I had a great opportunity to not be gory, but to actually be um, horrible in the sense of horrible, horrible. <laughs> so, and make you play the tapes and make you play the music. And that's why it's one of the reasons why it's so gut wrenching. I'm sort of glad that I didn't have some of the other episodes that came in between the first episode and episode six, because they would have been very tough for me. I've never done a horror episode or show in my life. This is the most I've ever done. But this one was really about restraint. And it was really about, you know, letting the audience experience this, bringing them into this world and not manipulating them in the sense of, oh, my God, there's a knife going through someone's belly. How horrible that is. But manipulating, in a sense, their minds into thinking about what is going on that you don't see. So the, the closing of the frame, as I call it, the reducing of your vision actually allows your imagination to expand and fill the space. And in that, I think it's a, it's a more satisfying um, artistic achievement because of that. Very well said. Yeah. Well, of course, uh, Paris, you're on, the, you're on the Dolby podcast. So I'm going to ask you about, mm. about sound. There's, there's so oh, much. Because I made some notes about sound. Oh, good. There's so much <laughs> extraordinary sound work uh, in, in this entire series. You know, it, it, the importance of sound, even from the first moments of episode one, become clear because we hear horrific things happening in the apartment next door as the sounds come through the air vents, but we don't see what's going on. So, but yeah, you again, your imagination fills the gap. Your imagination takes it over. 
I love the way you said that, you know, let the audience uh, uh, play the tape themselves because it, it, it's, it ends up being even more horrifying that way. But there's particularly your episode, episode six, had such a great opportunity for sound design with your deaf character and his family and his posse, as, as you say. Tell us about uh, crafting the sound for Tony's world and specifically those decisions that you made about uh, working with the sound team about how to depict. It's interesting. It doesn't go to silence, but it plays almost internally what his experience of it might be. Well, the actual sound mix I wasn't available to be at, I have to say first off, because I was shooting The Watcher at that time, yet another Ryan Murphy uh, extravaganza. But Joe Barnett and Laura Wiest, and I think we had some additional re-recording mixing by Jamie Hart, killed it. They took what we had done, Taylor Mason, the editor, and I, had done as sort of a sketch, and they made it beautiful. I mean, we had done some things where we took the sound out and we added low rumbles. They mastered it and made it so much better. And they had Alexis Woodall Martin and they had Tom Neninger, who are post-production, you know, Kings. Alexis is actually the president of Ryan's company, who are very, very attuned to the power of sound. And so if you watch it, if you watch it, you can't watch it without the sound on, but if you watch it from beginning to end, and you've already seen the episode, you'll see the structure of sound that carries through the whole thing. From that very first birth scene, there's an absence of sound. And then the first thing you'll hear is music, of course, and the baby crying. And then other voices will start to trickle in. And then you go into the waiting room where you're completely in Tony's perspective for the first time. And there is no sound, only a low rumble again. So you realize you're in that child's hearing world now where his hearing is degraded to the point that he's only hearing these rumbles. And then it snaps back into current sound when the nurse comes in. And so we constantly were shifting your perspective and putting you as much as we could in Tony's place. In fact, it's interesting, the, the original scene with the doctor and his mother where he, she finds out that he was deaf. Uh, in my cut, we originally did that without sound at all, completely from the child's perspective. But we found that you really needed to hear very clearly the information. <laughs> and so we had to go back to, to some semblance of sound. But then he gets to the club and he's just thumping, just thumping. You hear the sound as a deaf person might experience it. Now, this is an extrapolation. It's a creative sort of amalgamation of roar and music and distant thumping that, you know, some people who are deaf have explained to us that's kind of what the world is like. So we invented our own sort of musical vocabulary. But then that shifts into the music. And now we're at the party. And then it goes back out again when he meets that guy. And that guy rejects him because he's deaf. And Tony's left alone in his partially silent world. So throughout, we kept saying, when do we take the sound out? When do we bring the sound in? And the music, Nick Cave and uh, what's his, who is it? Warren Ellis and that company also are weaving the concept of the music through that sound. And it, we were debating. This wasn't done like frivolously at all. Sometimes the script would say there's no sound, for instance, at the dinner scenes with the family. But people who were deaf and people who had family members felt that you should be able to hear them talking because there are other hearing people there. But sometimes we would take the sound out, like when Tony leaves the bar with, well, he doesn't leave with Dahmer, but when Tony and Dahmer are left in the bar, the sound goes back out again. And you're into Tony's head and Tony's in a position of power where he rejects Jeff for now. So how we used it in the back and forth and the discovery of kind of an equivalent of deaf sound is one of the most beautiful things that I think comes out of the episode. The pizza parlor scene, for instance, if you look at it very carefully, it starts with the noise of the pizza parlor in a very wide shot. But once we get to the table, once the viewer comes to the table with the guys, the sound is gone and it's just that murmur, that ebbing, you know, um, were of what might be in the head of a deaf person and just their sides for five minutes. And it works great. I'm glad you brought that up because our friends at Netflix gave us a clip uh, of the pizza parlor scene.
Paris, I love that you brought up the pizza parlor scene and you're right. It starts, you know, it's, it starts off with a, a, with a normal sound treatment. And then once we get into the table with them and the conversation, then we go into to Tony's POV. But I, I, I'd love for you to just tell me a little bit more about shooting that particular sequence. It's, you know, as you said, it's, it's long and it was such a courageous decision to let that play without, you know, uh, uh, with this stylized uh, treatment uh, of sound. And it's just, it's riveting. I, I, I thought it was just amazing. And then to learn that, you know, these are, these are uh, you know, folks who have done their, doing their first time acting, it's just a, an amazing achievement. Yeah, fortunately, Jared, Jared and Michael, the other two guys who are not Tony, were more and more experienced actors. So in our rehearsal, which was several hours long, we sat around a table, we worked the script, and we made sure that it was comfortable slang that was period appropriate and easily to convey. So they became very comfortable with each other. They became It became, you know, a scene of, of talk among friends. And then I said with the camera, let's be at the table as much as possible. Let's let the viewer pull up a chair and be into this conversation, immersed in it, and really have that experience. Admittedly, you have to read the subtitles, but, uh, you know, after you've gotten used to that, you get to really just enjoy being a fly in the wall of their gossipy, but really at the same time, dreamy um, explanation of, of, of who Tony really is and what he's all about. Um, that is one of my favorite scenes in the in the episode, too. I just love the camaraderie that comes through. And I just love the fact that you feel their signs and you get to understand that signing isn't just the spelling out of words, but it's also the expression, you know, I'm going up, you know, to, to Madison and I'm going to make it. You feel like, oh, I can see just with their hands and understand more than I thought I could with deaf people. And I hope it'll, it'll allow people to sort of be more open to just having experiences, hanging out with people who are hearing impaired and getting to know them and learning a little bit about how they express themselves, you know, how they get around what we all call such a grave disability. But it's not that great because there is a, a joyful culture of ASL that allows them to express themselves. So I'm super, super fantastically fond of that. And you did notice there's sort of an underwater sound to that scene. The whir is kind of muffled, and I think they may have put in actual underwater sound with it. And I think that is so clever because it gives you the experience like when you go in a bathtub and you just dunk your whole head in, and that becomes analogous to what they would actually might be slightly hearing in the process. So I think the, the, those guys and gal were brilliant in the choices that they made in terms of structuring this. I agree. I agree. And I think it's some of the boldest, uh, most creative sound design I've heard on on, on episodic uh, uh, television in a, in a long time. So kudos to them. One thing team. that I didn't want to talk about, though, that they didn't notice too much, and no one's mentioned it, but in the very last scene, when um, Dahmer actually, um, <clears throat> you know, eats a piece of meat, um, something fascinating happens with the sound which is he's troubled. You hear the sounds of the street and the sounds of noise going on in his head as he's setting the place. And then as he takes that first bite, the sound of the street goes away and you only hear his breathing and sort of a relaxing. And again, without words, that's just sound design. And the, and the music hasn't come in yet telling you what the story really is, is that he wanted to keep Tony with him forever. And in Tony, he found it silenced the voices and the anger and the frustration that he heard in his cracked up brain. And then it goes to black and the music comes in. It's just really an elegant summary, especially since the episode's called Silence and deals so much with sound and with silence, that in that last moment, silence is achieved by Dahmer through his twisted psyche. So, so Paris and our, and our audience, in addition to our, our professional audience, we have a lot of uh, film students, aspiring filmmakers. And obviously, I mean, you have built just an enormously successful career as a director uh, of episodic television. When you have a, a show like Dahmer, when you are one of a number of creative artists who are coming in to direct episodes of a, of, of a show like this, I, I'd love to hear your take on how, how you navigate the, sort of that line of, of expressing your own creative voice. And obviously Ryan Murphy is coming to you because you're, uh, you're, you know, you have a lot to say. How do you navigate sort of 
putting your own creative voice into it while knowing that there has to be a consistency across the entire series uh, and, and the arc of the storytelling and, and across the tone of the entire piece. Honestly, I try to reduce myself as much as possible. And I think one of the reasons why I'm successful in television is because I try to elevate the story and use the skills that I've acquired to make the story the thing you're thinking about. I don't want people really thinking about me, the director, when they're watching this. I want them just to be engulfed in the story. And this is a perfect example. And I think a successful television director, if that's what you aspire to do, is less of an auteur, less of someone who's showing you you know, the great Quentin Tarantino kinds of shots or the beautiful Wes Anderson design that makes you think, oh, look at that incredible auteur mind behind all this. You're sort of bringing everyone together. You are hosting this party in which you want everyone to shine and you're trying to be as invisible as possible. You're trying to make it about what they see on the screen and not have them think until the credit rolls that someone put it together. It's supposed to feel natural. And one of the reasons why I enjoy this job of, of being a television director is I get to go to all these different families and just figure out a way to how, how to make them functional and how to make sure that everyone's respected and every actor brings their best game and people are comfortable. And if that happens, the work becomes bigger than I could have imagined. I've often said that if I actually were doing the things that I just want to do, it wouldn't be very good. It would be OK. You know, it's sort of like my daily shot list. It's OK. But it's not until we sit on the stage and we see what the actors want to do and the DP has an idea and the prop guy has a new prop that the thing really becomes magical. So if you are interested in directing and you're that kind of person who enjoys throwing a party and not so much ordering people around and telling them what to do and getting your vision and all that other stuff, if you're really interested in creating an environment of basically of love where everyone can feel they're a storyteller, this is a good job for you. Because there's a 300 storytellers worked on Dahmer, 300 different storytellers, whether it's in costumes, whether it's in design. And so you bring them all together in a collaborative spirit that, that makes something greater than yourself. And that should be the joy of it. And then just one thing on the form, Jason McCormick, who was the original director of photography and did some of the episodes going through, really set a template for how the show should be shot. The stillness of the camera, the composition of Jeffrey, the lack of Jeffrey's point of view, all those rules were very defined in the beginning. But then we got to episode six and we said, hmm, Jason, how many of these rules are actually going to allow us to tell this story? So we had to keep the rules generally, but we also had to evolve them to tell a story that wasn't so much about Jeffrey Dahmer as it was about Tony Hughes. And that was OK. A series can absorb that. A series can become slightly different along its way, keeping its DNA but at the same time evolving into something that the particular story needs to tell. I'm thinking of that episode of The Last of Us, long, 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 long time, I think it's called, where it takes a departure to tell that particular story, and a stylistic departure from the show, but still it feels of a part with the series. And that's what we were doing with Six. So we have a little bit of leeway to evolve it a bit, you know, when the story demands it, but you still want it to feel like it's one of ten. Yeah, yeah. Well, we've talked about episode six, obviously, uh, quite a bit uh, during our conversation, but I also want to acknowledge your work on episode 10. You know, Ryan, Ryan came to you to and trusted you to bring this series home and to direct mm -hmm. the, the final episode. And I, I got to say, like, I, I just felt so conflicted by the time we got to the end because I felt... I felt upset, upset. I felt upset about feeling bad about Dahmer and the way he died, even in, in the light of everything that he had done. Um, I think that I failed because <laughs> I didn't feel bad. I really didn't. I was enjoying so much the head bashing and the death of Dahmer that I mean, maybe it's because I'm a vengeful person, but it's also the title of it. You know, the God of Vengeance idea was. Where does God take you? Does God take you to, you know, Dahmer finally finds God and is suddenly, you know, Christian and is baptized? Or does the God take you to what it did with Christopher, his assailant and murderer eventually, who is, believes he's also doing God's bidding as well? So I thought the idea of two, two different people acting basically on the orders of God is a really interesting idea. I was though team Christopher, I must say. I was team Christopher. And I didn't want you to really feel sympathetic. I wanted you to feel Jeffrey Dahmer knew his time had come. And when he looked at Christopher in the end, he knew the jig was up. 
and he was going to get what he deserved. And so, yeah, we got a little brutal with the pipe in the end, and maybe I was a touch too gleeful. But in, for me in my life, in my experience as a black gay man, that was my most enjoyable day of shooting. <laughs> <laughs> well said, Paris. Oh, goodness. <laughs> and then, and then I, I have to say, like we were talking about the restraint of it. That was a that was a, a, a that was a, a, a tough scene to watch. It, it was dramatically earned, of course. But I, for me, the 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 most sort of disturbing scene uh, uh, from a graphicness standpoint is then when uh, Richard Jenkins' character goes to see the body. That that was just a moment that really. That took my breath away. Yeah, that was difficult to do. I mean, that was Evan laying there, and Richard Jenkins is such a masterful actor and didn't really want to see him until we were filming and really just felt what he felt as, as Jeffrey's father. And to me, what's sort of beautiful about it is, you know, a father's love just extends beyond. You know, it, it is so forgiving in this case that maybe to a fault, you could say, but that is sort of what are the boundaries of love? You know, he keeps loving this kid, even though he knows he, he probably is complicit in what he became. And yet he his love is there. And I love that sort of complex, tortured um, love uh, and, and bringing it out. And when you're dealing with Richard Jenkins, who is also just a master actor and, you know, delightful, you just want to see what they can bring. And so my whole job when the filming of that scene was to say as little as possible and to set up some shots that would capture the drama that would be interesting, but not to not to step in too much. I had Evan Peters and Richard Jenkins. I don't know if they really need me in this moment. <laughs> so sometimes that's kind of where you have to be. You just have to know genius is at hand and it isn't yours. So you are just going to take credit for it later. And that's going to be the way it is. <laughs> Very well put. So, uh, Paris, before before I let you go, um, I'd love for you to tell us a little bit about you know the, the longstanding work that you've done with the Directors Guild. You were the president of the organization for for two terms. Um, the work that you've done and the importance of the work that you've done to help pave the way for the next generation of diverse storytellers to find their way to the director's chair and to express themselves and to tell their stories. Yeah, I'm just really fortunate because I was a music video director and, uh, you know, I'd been in advertising for a while and I directed some music videos and John Wells saw my music video reel. Um, it's given to him by my manager who is 30 years later, still my manager, by the way, Steve Lovett. <laughs> and John saw a storyteller in those videos and gave me a shot doing an episode of television, which I did pretty well. And then he hired me again for that series, which was a short lived CBS show. Um, and then I, my career just sort of stalled after that. He was the only one who believed in me for a while. So I got a couple of jobs. I think I did Silk Stockings or something. And then finally, um, he had another show. And I didn't know when I was doing that job for him that his show would be ER. But it was ER. And he hired me again to direct ER, which for those of you who are uh, you know, post-ER, that show was a juggernaut. It was a show that 40 million people watched on Thursday nights. One in six Americans were watching ER live when it came on. It was so big. Um, and that then just launched my whole career. And since then, I've always said, well, who can I bring up? Who can I now that I'm in this position find a way to bring into the tent? And so I've worked with all the DGA's programs. I now run the Netflix Diversity Initiative. So we're bringing new directors in. And I'm thinking it's not just that. It's on the set. It's the prop person who wants to evolve to become a director. We've had you know, makeup artists like um, Stacey K. Black, who eventually she was a makeup artist on Glee, and now she's one of the busiest directors going. So we try to see who's next because, you know, there's lots of jobs out there and there's lots of opportunities, but they don't always find the people. So I sort of see myself as not only a mentor, but kind of a matchmaker to say, you know, what is the next opportunity that can be provided for this person? And when I run a show, I meet yeah, all kinds of directors all along, all kinds of directors. And sometimes, you know, there are people that, you know, people don't want to hire and I push them through. Nikki Cassell, when I was on Cold Case, was one. She had just done one film, The Woodsman, with Kevin Bacon, which was an outstanding film. And I thought she'd be perfect for Cold Case. And we hired her and that became one of her first episodes of television. Now she's gone on to be, 
you know, the Watchmen and so many other great things. You just have to look. And I figure if you're not going to look studios as hard, I'm going to look hard and I'm going to keep my eyes out and I'm going to listen. I'm going to see movies. I'm going to see who's out there and see who we can push along the way. Um, I, I teach at a lot of schools. I, you know, I've gone back to Harvard and talked and I've also gone to USC and to Arizona State and all sorts of places where I can be useful because I figure, you know, what's 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 it worth if you're not giving back in the process? So I'm going to keep doing that until my time becomes just me on an island in Hawaii, hopefully chilling. <laughs> I have a feeling it's going to be a long time before your phone stops ringing. Paris, <laughs> thank you so much for coming on the show. It's been it's, it's a great honor to have you on our show, and it's been a great pleasure for me to talk to you today. Well, I appreciate you, Glenn, and I appreciate the, the podcast. I've been listening to some of the earlier episodes, and I like this kind of deep dive into not just sound, but into the whole soul of what we do. So I appreciate you. Many thanks once again to Paris Barkley for sitting down today to talk to us about his remarkable work on the show. And thanks also to our friends at Netflix, as always, for putting this interview together and for providing us with those clips. Dahmer is currently streaming on Netflix and Dolby Vision and Dolby Atmos. And we have, as always, a link to the series in our show notes. And don't forget to check out the other podcast episode about Dahmer, which we posted earlier this week, discussing the show with the film's production and post-production teams. If you'd like even more conversations with artists and filmmakers about how they use technology to tell their stories, please be sure you are subscribed to us, the Dolby Institute podcast. You can find links to our show on all the major podcasting platforms, including our video version on YouTube in our show notes, or you can simply search for Dolby wherever you get your podcasts. If you're curious to know more about the Dolby Institute, head on over to dolbyinstitute.com. There you will find information about all of our programs. You can access the entire library of episodes of this podcast, and you can sign up for our mailing list. Until next time, thanks again for joining us. This is the Dolby Institute podcast. I am your host, Glenn Kaiser. Our producer and editor is Michael Coleman. Our executive producers are Amanda Schneider and Jack Ferry, with additional editing by Matt Nixon. And our production coordinator is Sonny Chen. Thank you for watching.